Uh, I'm Dave Pilati, uh, very excited to serve as your moderator and host this evening. Um, I see some new faces in uniform in the audience from the Naval Academy Prep School, welcome. And for lots of the familiar faces that are here, it's great to have you. This is our fourth lecture in the Issues and National Security Lecture Series. Um, we're delighted you could join us. This will run till 545. Um, both Dr. Khan and Dr. Blankshane said they have plenty of time for questions um, at the end of their lecture, so if you could save your questions, we'll have uh, at least 20, if not 30 minutes for you to talk back and forth with them. Tonight's topic is incredibly timely, which is why I think we have such a great turnout, is we are living arguably in one of the most interesting times in modern history in the United States from a perspective of civil military relations. And we are incredibly fortunate to have two leading voices in this field for you to talk with. Um, just to cover quickly, this is a four attribution lecture. It's actually being recorded, just so everyone's aware. Um, therefore, be, feel free to share any of the discussions with everybody in your network. Um, encourage them to go to the Naval War College website and check this out if they didn't get to make it. And I will also say for both of our doctors, um, keep in mind that the views that they expressed this evening are their views, their personal views, and do not necessarily reflect those of the college, the Navy, or the Department of Defense. Now, on to our speakers. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Lindsey Kahn and Jessica Blankshain, who are both from our National Security Affairs Department. As I said earlier, both are recognized scholars in this field who have a very interesting take on current state of affairs as well as historical. Lindsay came to the War College from the Council on Foreign Relations, where she worked as an International Affairs Fellow and an advisor to the Office of the Secretary of Defense. She specifically focused on issues pertaining to special operations and combating terrorism. Prior to that, she taught at the University of Northern Iowa in international relations, international security, U.S. foreign policy, and terrorism. She earned her Ph.D. from Duke University in political science. Jessica joined the War College from Harvard University, where she also earned her Ph.D. in political economy and government. Her research interests include civil military relations, bureaucratic politics, and organizational economics. As you will quickly see, um, they are both very popular with our students here because they teach leading edge practice and theory in this field, and they both teach a couple of very interesting electives. Ladies and gentlemen, Drs. Khan and Blankshane. All right, thank you, Dave, uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We're excited to be here with you tonight for this fourth lecture. Uh, and uh, as Dave said, uh, so I'm Jess, that's Lindsay. Uh, we, uh, people have people a hard time telling us, telling us apart. apart even when we don't accidentally dress alike, so we apologize for that. <laughs> um, but uh, we're both in the National Security Affairs Department, which for those of you who are trying to keep track of what the students are up to is the TSDM and NSDM courses that you may have heard about. And we also teach the Civil Military Relations elective that just wrapped up last week. Uh, and we, uh, again, as Dave sort of suggested, came to this subject from slightly uh, different trajectories and backgrounds. And as you'll see, we focus on slightly different issues in our research, but really fundamentally are both interested in this question of how states organize and try to control uh, violent force for uh, political policy purposes. And what we wanted to do today is try to do a quick uh, overview of this, and we are going to do our best to stop talking by 5.15 so that we leave enough time for you all to ask questions, which can be about anything that we've brought up during the talk or anything that we have not brought up during the talk but that you're curious about. Uh, so if you've heard the term civil military relations before, it may be in the context of something like one of the issues suggested in these headlines. In the US, frequently we'll talk about civil military relations when we talk about uh, the size or scope of the defense budget, when we're talking about um, sort of policy issues and military input into those policy issues, uh, whether the presidents are listening to their generals, those sorts of questions, uh, questions about the personal relationships between elected officials and military officers or those officials' own military backgrounds or lack thereof.
Uh, and of course, in an international context, we talk about all of these same issues and additionally have some others come up sometimes, things like uh, coup attempts, successful or not, and the military's sort of uh, ability to be a power player in politics and uh, help hand control of the government to one party or faction or another. So what we are hoping to do today is clarify a bit what we mean by this idea of civil-military relations as an academic discipline that we study and focus on a couple issues in particular, one being how governments try to control their militaries, uh, another being a question of, in the United States context, this question of a familiarity gap, is the military too distant from the population, uh, and if so, should we be concerned about it? And then finally, uh, concluding with some, some discussion of this idea of uh, trust in the military, which is another thing you may have heard about, the, the high levels of trust in the US military, and what sorts of national security and military policy consequences that might have. So we're gonna try to do all of that by 5.15. So I will hand it over to Lindsay to kick us off. Great. Okay. So, um, great. Th great that you could come. Thanks for being here. Uh, so, as Jess said, the first thing we're going to talk about is just a little clarity on what we mean by civil-military relations, because I think a lot of people either have never encountered this term, or if they have, they tend to think that we're talking about how the military interacts with NGOs, for example. That's not what we're talking about. When we say civil-military relations, what we're really talking about is this triangle of relationships amongst three groups in a society. And just as a little bit of sort of philosophical background, um, the problems of civil-military relations arise when you have a society that has differentiated its uh, labor um, to different groups, right? So if you have, say, a hunter-gatherer society where everybody does the work of the society when there is peace and when there is war, everybody drops uh, their farming or hunting and gathering and picks up a spear and goes, you don't have civil military relations, right? Because there is identity between those, those groups. By the same token, if you have a society that is ruled by, say, a warrior caste, like a shogunate or something like that, again, you do not have civil military relations because there is identity between the government and the military. But in most societies, even dictatorships in many cases, even non-democracies, but especially in democracies, you will have these three different groups, right? There is the population, the society in general, and they delegate the work of governance to a group of people who form the government, who are supposed to be, so in a democracy it's delegated from the people, right? In, in non-democracies, they're just separate groups. But in either case, the government is supposed to do the, the running, right? And then there is this other delegated group, the people who fight, right? And as Jess pointed out, the thing that, the question that motivates both of us is how do different societies think about and decide to organize and regulate and legitimize the use of violence for political ends, usually externally focused, but not always. So when you have a society that has this division of labor, then you get the problems that we are interested in, the problems of civil military relations. And what we have up here is just some examples of the kinds of things that each side would expect and demand from the other. So in this relationship, well, the, the, most, the most common relationship, the one that you would see in any society, regardless of what type of government it is, is this one between the government and the military, this control relationship. But that's not a one-way relationship. It's not just that the military has to obey. The government also has responsibilities in this relationship. And we've written them up here uh, as responsible foreign policy, having a strategy, budgeting, right? The government has to do those things or else the military can't function. In return, the military owes the government professionalism, a sense of duty, their advice on policy matters, etc. Down at the bottom, you have the relationship between the population and the military. Now, the military is always going to be drawn from the population in some way, but it might be drawn from the population in terms of large-scale conscription, or it might be drawn from the population by a volunteer force. There are many different ways to do that, right? And so that relationship might differ depending on how the society has organized itself. But in all cases, you're going to hope that the population gives the military some respect, 
some support, but also exercises some oversight, doesn't just let them get away with whatever they want. And at the same time, that the military gives the society some respect and some professionalism, that the military does not look down, for example, on civilians um, who are not serving in uniform. And then finally, over on the other side, you have the relationship between the population and the government. And this one tends to get left out uh, of these discussions, but we both think it's very important in that in a democracy, by the way, that side of the triangle drops out when you're talking about non-democracies, because there is no uh, popular accountability in non-democracies. But in democracies, the population's job is to determine whether the government is using the military appropriately, right? Are they giving them the appropriate budget? Are they making good foreign policy, right? And if the population thinks the government is not doing these things, they are supposed to vote them out. Well, one of the really important implications of this is that it's the population's job to judge the government, not the military's job, right? And that's one of the norms of civil military relations that we might talk about. Okay, what I wanted to do first um, is just in a sort of overview, a comparative overview of that one relationship that happens in every country, that uh, government-military side of things. What are the different ways that governments try to exercise controls over their military? And when we talk about government control of the military, what we're really saying is, how does a group of people who, have, who are supposed to govern the society delegate all of the uh, effective control of deadly force to a different group of people and then expect that group of people just to do what they tell them? Right? I mean, you, you see what the problem might be, right? <laughs> Is that if, if the group of people with um, a sort of monopoly on deadly force decide that they don't like what they're being told to do, they could just not do it. They could resist. They could coup. They could do any number of things uh, that would not constitute government control of the military. So how do, how do governments solve this problem? Every government uses a combination of these things but many governments rely more heavily on one than another uh, or on a couple. So I'm just gonna give you some examples. One way of doing this is to make sure that the government and military officers uh, come from, have the same identity in some way, right? That they either come from the same class, right? You see Prince Charles in his military uniform indicating an identity between the ruling uh, the, the ruling class of the United Kingdom and the military officers. Over here, you have Hafez and Bashar al-Assad, right? Ethnicity or religion, they are both Alawite, Shiite. What they have done is stacked the Syrian military officer corps with Alawite Shiites. In other words, making sure that the interests of that group of people are close to their own interests so that they have very little reason to disagree with each other. More examples, um, parallel military structures, right? Like a palace guard. This is designed to deter one group from trying to resist because they're afraid that another group might then resist them with armed force as well. In other words, that if there are two groups of armed people running around, it is less likely that either one of them would rebel. Um, and I've got a couple of examples for you up here. Good old Saddam Hussein with his Republican guard at the top, right? An elite group of people who got much better budget, uh, budget share than the rest of the Iraqi army, who got much better equipment, right? So the Iraqi army was much bigger, but they were made up mostly of conscripts, made up, uh, they had very, very poor equipment, uh, and if they had wanted to coup, they would have had to face the elite Republican guard, right? And down here, you have Iran and the Revolutionary Guard, Right? The same kind of thing, an elite unit that could easily um, resist a large-scale uprising by the um, less privileged but larger group uh, of soldiers. Another one that you will see in, in many cases is professionalism. Right, um, The idea here is that if you inculcate officers with a sense of duty, with a sense of self-restraint, that it is morally right or normatively right for them to obey the government, then they will not rebel against the government, 
right? Uh, here is Shinzo Abe uh, looking, uh, doing a review of, of his offices. Uh, Japan is a very good example of a culture of self-restraint among offices. Another one is pervasive security or surveillance. Um, you might be familiar with the idea of political offices or commissars in, say, the Soviet Red Army or in the Chinese Army. This is when you have um, a state secret police or intelligence service that keeps tabs on everyone such that everyone in the military is too afraid to express different opinions or, or to uh, talk about rebellion or motivate any kind of, of uh, anti-government activity. It's very effective, um, but it's also uh, very detrimental to the um, sort of morale and, and effectiveness of your troops. And then finally, I don't have a picture up here for this one because it's, it's hard to get a good picture of this. Monetary incentives, right? You pay your military. There is a reason that any time a state is having a debt crisis, the military still get paid, right? Because those are the last people you want angry about missing paychecks because they have the tanks, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but also, there are many countries where the military so for, think of countries like Pakistan, um, where the tax base is perhaps not so good, uh, where taxation does not provide enough to support the kind of military that the state thinks it needs. So what do they do? They allow the military to make their own money by, working, by, by participating in business, by owning business, by running businesses. China was also an example of this for quite some time until the uh, Chinese Communist Party decided that it led to too much corruption and they tried to crack down on it. Okay, so hopefully you, you can think of your own countries or think of countries that you know about and you recognize some of these things. As I said, most countries use many of these. Some of you might be thinking um, here of the Federalist Papers from the United States history, right? Having the National Guard or the militia and the federal forces if and when we had federal forces and the idea was that you know, the power wouldn't be concentrated in any one place. Um, so why does this matter? Why does it matter how a state does this? Well, some of these produce militaries that are not very good at doing what we all think of as military things, right? I'll bring the Iraqi army back up, right? The Iraqi army was very unlikely to coup for all kinds of the reasons that you saw up there. They were also not a very good army because they had been coup-proofed to the point where they were ineffective at just about everything. Right? Another problem that you can get is that some modes are not appropriate for democratic societies. In other words, if you insist that all of your officers have to come from the same ethnic or religious or ideological background as your ruling class, that doesn't seem like a very democratic way of choosing officers, does it? Uh, it's also not meritocratic. It means that you are choosing officers on some basis other than them being good at their jobs, which is also a problem for the first reason. So this, this was an overview of sort of that one side of the triangle that every single country has to deal with. Um, and it has implications for all kinds of other things as well. But we do want to talk about the other sides of the triangle. So I'm going to give this back to Jess, and she's going to take up the US case uh, and talk about the problem of the familiarity gap. Thank you. Uh, so yes, as Lindsay said, we also uh, don't want to neglect the other sides of the triangle. So one thing um, that's interesting to look at in the US case and that you may hear uh, in the media on occasion in a number of different articles, um, uh, is anybody familiar with James Fallow's Tragedy of the American Military uh, from The Atlantic in 2015 uh, is one of a number of articles sort of in this vein making this argument about the familiarity gap, which is the idea uh, that going back to our triangle, uh, that the, the distance between the population and the military has gotten too big. Particularly, this is often made in the context of the uh, sort of post-Vietnam, end of the draft era, all volunteer military. The idea that the American military is now a separate, uh, sometimes called warrior caste, uh, that is separate from society, that these two points of the triangle are very dif distant from each other. And that this has implications, uh, not just for that side of the triangle, the relationship between those two, but also for the public's ability to hold the government accountable or its interest in holding the government accountable. 
um, either that the public doesn't, isn't informed enough about what the military is doing and how it works to be able to hold the government accountable for military policy, or simply that they don't care because it doesn't matter to them. Uh, so to look into this question, uh, we, need, we need to answer a couple sort of sub-questions, right? The first being, is there this familiarity gap that people talk about? Is the military in the United States really that distant from society, uh, sort of in absolute terms, in historical terms, these kinds of questions? Uh, if it is, then does that matter for how people think about the military and military policy? Do people who have familiarity and connection to the military, either because they were in it themselves or because they know people who are or were in it, uh, think differently about use of the military and some of these national security policy questions than people who don't have that familiarity? And then finally, is there anything we can do about it if the answer to those two are yes? Are there things that the government can do to change the level of familiarity that the citizens have with the military or not? So we'll start at the beginning. Uh, usually this argument gets made in terms of the idea of uh, the other 1%, as it's sometimes called. The idea that only 1% of the United States is bearing this responsibility of providing national defense. And one thing that's important to remember uh, is to try to put this in historical context. Usually when people cite this statistic, uh, they compare it to here, uh, to essentially the World War II era when you can see uh, on our little graph here that nearly 10% of the adult population was uh, participating in military service, right? A uh, majority of able-bodied males were serving. So we see this big spike in the military population. And when you make this comparison of today, which you can see we had to put two graphs together here, so I apologize. Um, but today, right, we, have, uh, we do in fact have a small percentage of society serving. And if you compare that to World War II, it looks very, very small. But it's important to keep in mind the broader context that if you look at this whole graph, World War II is the oddity, right? This is the, the sort of strange point in American history when we had this mass mobilization that saw such a huge part of the population in service. It's actually quite common in American history to have uh, one, two, three percent of the population in military service, even during times of significant conflict. Uh, and certainly, uh, there are discussions to be had about what it means to have a military this size doing a lot more around the world. But historically speaking, it's not odd for only one percent of the United States population to be in the military. And it's also important to remember, if we're concerned just about that number, the percent, right? We think it's too small, potentially. Assuming that we are not planning to do anything to decrease the size of the overall population, then our option to change that number is to either make the military bigger, right, which requires money, or to increase turnover in the military in some way so that the military is effectively producing veterans more quickly, right? So those are just important contexts to keep in mind when we're looking at this picture. Now, of course, the other question is, it's possible that we have sort of a, a normal percentage of the population serving in the military, but that this percentage is somehow more isolated than they used to be. They used to be sort of more distributed through society, and now it's still 1%, but it's sort of segregated, and only a small number of people actually know someone in the military. It's not easy to get data on this. We don't have a lot of it, but we have a little bit. So this is from a study done by the Pew Research Center, uh, which is a quite reputable polling public opinion uh, institution, where uh, this was from 2011, I believe is this data, where they asked a representative sample of Americans whether they had, uh, knew people in the military in various contexts. Uh, and we put this slide up because it's very surprising to a lot of people. These numbers are a lot higher than many people expect them to be, particularly this one. Uh, so they asked, do you have a close friend or family member who has served in Iraq or Afghanistan? And more than half of their samples said yes. Uh, the numbers, not surprisingly, go up a bit um, when you go to veteran from any era, right? And then when you go from immediate family member to the less restrictive any family member, which would include things like grandparents, aunts, and uncles, it goes up even further. So this suggests that the military might not be as isolated as some arguments suggest. Now, there is some evidence that this is um, 
that the, this picture may change over time, right? So here we see um, the question about do you have an immediate family member who has ever served uh, broken out by age group? And you do see, which is probably fits most people's intuition, that among older Americans, they're much more likely to say they have an immediate family member who has served. Now, part of that is because they uh, just uh, logistically have more immediate family members who are of age that they could have served in the military, right? Your 18 to 29 year olds are unlikely to have children old enough to be able to serve in the military. Uh, but also this is what we would expect given this picture, right? That there was a time when there were just a lot more veterans. Um, and you do also see, this is the other argument that you see a lot, the military becoming a family business. Uh, you do see that especially among younger people, uh, those who have served in the military are more likely to have veteran family members than those who have not served in the military, right? We do see that in our data here. Uh, again, this is probably not surprising. Uh, we see this in a number of different professions and occupations uh, that they tend to sort of run in families in particular ways. Uh, the question is, do we find it particularly concerning when it comes to the military, which is something we can have a discussion about in Q&A. Um, so, okay, that's all fine and good. We get this picture that there is potentially some separation between the military and society, maybe not as big uh, or drastic as uh, some pictures suggest. Does it matter? Do the people who know someone in the military or were in the military have different attitudes about national security policy than people who don't or weren't? Uh, again, this is from the same Pew study. They effectively find that, uh, so light green is people who don't have an immediate family member who served. Dark green is they do have an immediate family member who served. And you see some differences here on this side in some of these questions about uh, sort of patriotism, questions about military service, would you uh, advise someone to join the military? They do find some differences. They don't, however, find differences over here in attitudes about Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and this one in particular is interesting um, because people love to cite uh, this number, that half of Americans who don't have a family member who served feel that the wars that didn't affect them as evidence of this gap, but they fail to note the other one, uh, that people who do have an immediate family member who served say the same thing. Uh, we do have some evidence, both from this survey, uh, so great, so this is friends and family, this is its veterans themselves, post 9-11 veterans. We have some evidence from this and other academic studies, which we can talk about later, um, that veterans in some circumstances have slightly different attitudes about things like use of force and other military policy. Not that they are more hawkish. We don't have evidence that veterans, those with significant military experience, are significantly more likely to want to go to war. Uh, we do have some evidence that if the government is going to go to war, they know that veterans are more likely to want to use overwhelming force to do so. Um, and here you see some evidence that in this survey at least, veterans were more likely to say that Iraq and Afghanistan were worth it than were non-veterans, which uh, potentially gets into all sorts of uh, complicated psychological reasons having to do with um, motivated reasoning and wanting to feel like if you uh, participated in something that was potentially costly to you that it was worth it. Um, so this leads to this final question, getting back to the triangle and accountability of can the government do anything to change this familiarity level, right? Again, sometimes people po point to the end of the draft, the introduction of the all-volunteer force as sort of the point of this separation, which implies that if we changed our policies, for example, went back to conscription, that we would see more familiarity or potentially the, the people sort of doing more to oversee the government in its use of force. Uh, there are a number of academic studies that look into this, which again, we can uh, go into in detail in the Q&A if anybody's interested, but they look at questions like, do, is the public more or less likely to support conflict when there is conscription than when there is not conscription? Um, if uh, more people feel that they will be personally affected by a conflict, are they less likely to support it? 
if people think that conflict is likely to be costly in aggregate, right, either financially or in terms of casualties, are they less supportive of that conflict? The answer is uh, generally yes, but subject to uh, the benefits of the conflict, so people are to some extent rational about this. Um, and also, there's some evidence that people are less likely to support conflicts when they think that the system that the government is using to recruit manpower is unfair, uh, which again, we can talk about uh, later what unfair means in that context. Uh, Lindsay and I did a little bit of research on this to try to dig into this question, uh, looking at the question of, basically we were motivated by this idea that during Vietnam, uh, the draft was used, but mobilizing the guard and reserves was seen as too costly to be used. It would involve too many people, make too many people sensitive to the cost of this conflict, particularly because of the types of people it was involving. So the guard and reserve were not sent overseas for the most part. Uh, where today we see the reverse. The guard and reserves have been used uh, nearly constantly, uh, while a draft is only brought up as this sort of political third rail. And so we wanted to know what would happen if we told people uh, essentially that either there would be a draft, the Guard and Reserve would be mobilized, only the active duty troops would be mobilized, how this affected their views about a hypothetical military engagement. And essentially what we found is uh, that when we tell people there's going to be a draft, they are less supportive of this hypothetical conflict. When we tell them the Guard and Reserves mobile are gonna be mobilized, it doesn't uh, really affect their uh, willingness to support this conflict relative to a baseline of just the active duty force. And in particular, we find that this is perceived as costly by the public, both in terms of aggregate casualties and the likely that they will be, likelihood that they will be personally affected. But this is not. People don't perceive this as being costly. And even more surprisingly, uh, we find that we don't find a lot of evidence for this idea that people who feel that they will be personally affected by a conflict are less likely to support it. So that's what this is showing here, is that um, if, if the dot is over here, it means that perceiving that you're gonna pay a cost makes you less supportive. So in terms of overall casualties, if people think casualties are going to be high, they're less supportive of the conflict. This fits with a lot of the literature. But in terms of perceiving that they will pay a personal cost, that did not make people decrease their support for the conflict, uh, which is confusing and interesting and something that we can come back to. The bottom line essentially from all of this is that this relationship between people's familiarity with the military, their policy preferences about use of the military, and the way that the military is drawn from society is significantly more complicated than we often think it is. Uh, so, one final thing here um, on the U.S. is this question of, we talked about a familiarity gap, but one of the other things that come out of this is this question of um, not just does the, the public know anyone in the military, but what do they think about the military in general? How much do they trust the military, right, relative to other institutions in society? And what does that mean for policy, not just in terms of use of force, but all sorts of policies about defense budgets um, and other uh, national security and military policy. Right, so now we're getting to that third side of the triangle, the relationship between the public and the government with respect to the military. And as Jess said, <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one of the issues that in the United States has become really salient recently is this issue of how much the public trusts the military uh, relative to other social institutions, what does that trust actually mean? What does it consist of? What does it mean to say I trust the military or I support the military? Um, and what implications does that have for how well the public uh, exercises oversight over the government? Um, and so we've put up here, um, this is just a snapshot. We can tell you that um, trust in almost all institutions, in almost all Western societies, has been declining generally uh, since the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, a broad trend. But in the United States, as you can see, trust in the military has actually trended up. Um, there are only a few other professions um, and other institutions that 
have that trend. So for example, I think veterinarians, people trust veterinarians. They, they trust um, firefighters, but uh, they do not trust, as you can see, the church. They don't trust big business. They don't trust Congress. They don't trust policemen. Uh, they don't trust um, <clears throat> the Supreme Court anymore. Uh, so this is, this is an issue that we frequently see in terms, uh, couched in civil military relations terms, um, but we can also think of this as a, a real problem for just democratic governance in general, right? This decline in trust in institutions. And where the military aspect of this comes in is what happens when you have a society that doesn't trust anyone except the people who use force? Um, we don't know what the answer to that is. We're a little worried that we're going to find out at some point soon. Um, this is just a bit more granularity like Lindsay was, was saying with some other professions and occupations. Right, yeah, so you can look at this while, I, while I'm talking. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we have also begun to find, and this is a more recent trend, uh, you are probably all aware of the growing um, partisan polarization of American, U.S. American society. Uh, one of the things that we are finding is that that trust in the military statistic also differs by partisanship. Um, so Democrats' trust in the military tends to stay fairly steady. It's got a slight upward trend, but it's not a steep upward trend, um, but it stays fairly steady over time. Republicans' trust in the military has a steep upward trend, but it tanks when the president is a Democrat. Um, so this is an interesting and, and potentially troubling issue if you've got a significant divergence between parties in how much they trust the military. But considering that we still don't know what it means to trust the military, we're not super worried as yet. Right. <laughs> so, but, so what are some of the policy implications um, the defense budget, this is one of the things Jess mentioned, right? Um, is the public able, is the public willing to exercise oversight over their members of Congress in terms of military budgeting? Uh, does, the, does the public have any idea what kind of budget the military needs, how much is enough, et cetera, et cetera? Um, we can talk a little bit about the national emergency, the declaration of national emergency and border wall funding. I think the, the salient civil military relations issue there is how interesting it is that the DOD is probably the only place that has enough money just sloshing around that the, that the president can say, you know what, I think I'll take a bunch of that and use it for something else. Um, and then finally, the government shutdowns. You know, this most recent time, uh, the Department of Defense was not directly affected because they had already had a funding bill passed, which is, of course, interesting. The one thing that Congress can manage to agree on is let's give the military money. And not, we're, not in, we're not implying that there's anything wrong with that. We're just implying that it's interesting that that's the only thing they can all agree on, right? Um, in previous shutdowns, however, that was not the case. Uh, there was not necessarily a DOD funding bill already in place. But then if you paid attention to the congressional debates, they frequently centered on, we need to fix the shutdown because we have to make sure that the troops are taken care of. And again, neither of us is implying that the troops shouldn't be taken care of. What we do question is this assumption that only the troops matter and that nobody else should be taken care of, which is the implication when that's the only thing that the congressional debates focus on. Um, so in a sense, we worry about the military being used as a sort of uh, political prop, essentially, uh, that, that it is a way to avoid debate on more difficult issues that they don't agree on. That if you just trot out the need to help the military, you can kind of paper over all of the things that they disagree on, which is a problem because in a democratic society, the way you're supposed to reach uh, policy is by talking about what the policy should be and making hard choices and compromising and things like that. And we see this on a range of other issues, too. Um, I mean, everything from food stamps, right, when there are discussions about uh, sort of food assistance, often it uh, will come back to how does it affect the troops. Uh, similarly, even with uh, some of back during, if you remember, uh, some of Michelle Obama's uh, efforts towards obesity uh, or fighting childhood obesity, right? Again, this against often obesity, then, not towards yes, it. not for obesity, but uh, that that this gets framed in terms of what about military readiness, right? That we should care about this because it means that children aren't able to join the military, right? That this whole range 
of policies that are ostensibly have nothing to do with the military get funneled back to what does it mean for the troops. Or even ones that do have something to do with the military, but they also matter for other people, and the, the, the debate always comes back to how does this matter for the military, um, and, and that's kind of where, um, where all the concern is put. Um, so we just wanted to put up a couple more examples of how this trust issue might affect policy. Uh, the one, uh, so we said outward facing, the troops in Syria. Um, if you've seen, uh, General Votel was just quoted in a, what, a CNN interview, um, which is a question in and of itself. Like, why did General Votel agree to do a CNN interview? That just doesn't seem like a really good idea. It's gone so well in the past for other commanders. Yeah. <laughs> but he did. He, he agreed to do this interview. And in the interview, he said, uh, I was not asked what my advice was on the Syria thing. I would not have given the president the advice to do what he's doing, and I think it's a really bad idea. Th how is this gonna play in the public, right? You've got a, a fairly respected um, general who uh, has, has no partisan past, um, certainly doesn't seem like a partisan, um, and, and he's out there criticizing the president's policy, uh, saying that he wasn't consulted. You know, th this is one of those things where we wonder how that will affect um, both public opinion and trust in the military and feelings about the military. And then you've got internally facing uh, policies like the integration of women into uh, formerly closed combat specialties, um, whether or not transgender people can serve, but also um, a lot of other things like um, just BRAC, the base realignment and enclosure, which is still a thing after all of these years. Um, the, the issue of whether we can close down missile silos in, in rural Midwestern states um, because we don't actually need them or anything, but those uh, members of Congress don't want those to leave their states because that means a lot of influence lost for them, right? So there are all kinds of ways in which um, the status of the military and the policy preferences of the military interact, even, even if the military were really a completely non-political, completely non-partisan body of people who were fully professional and focused only on doing their jobs, even if that were the case, it would still interact with domestic politics in ways that we think are interesting and important to look at. Uh, and uh, so unless you have anything else to add, we will stop there actually on time for once. So yeah. uh, so we know we've thrown a lot at you on a range of different topics, uh, and we are happy to take any I of your questions, background. thank you, about um, these issues or any others that come to mind. So if you could just raise your hand, I'll give you the mic so everyone can hear the question. Thank you. It's on. Yes. <laughs> Doctors, I have a, a question on uh, making sure the military gets paid. Mm -hmm. Is this because Congress uh, wants to be sure that we're safe and secure, or is it because Congress wants to, to protect themselves from actually not doing a job that they're paid to do <laughs> from the top on down? So, you know, it's, it's more of a self-preservation of their uh, uh, political beliefs more than interest in the country, because right now, Honestly, if I had a, a B-52 with 30 megatons, I would drop it on DC. That's how mad I am. Anyway, <laughs> do you have a book on this? <laughs> I'd love to read it. Um, there are lots of books that we can recommend. Um, um, I, I, I mean, I think the, the first answer is, is yes, they, they care about both, right? Um, that, that we have reason to believe both that they're, they, legitimately there are reasons, as Lindsay said at the beginning, uh, in the control section to want to pay your military, right? That's generally a good idea, uh, both for maintaining control of the military and for making sure that the military has the resources to do what it needs to do to protect you. At the same time, it's, it seems very likely um, that elected officials are also concerned about the politics and the optics of what happens if you are seen to not support the troops and also understand that this is a leverage point, particularly across parties, right? To, to Lindsay's point, 
this is, this is sort of the one thing that the parties can agree on is that the troops should be paid. Uh, and therefore, that's sort of a, an easy place to go to try to solve this problem instead of uh, actually digging into some of the more actually divisive issues. Yeah, and just to, I, I agree with all of that, just to get at you a sort of specific uh, dig about are they trying to avoid doing their jobs. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think, you know, I think most public servants do want to do their jobs, but they, they, they have a, a whole list of things they want, and doing their jobs is just one of those things, and sometimes it gets eclipsed by the other things that they want. Um, and in this particular case, uh, you know, I think a lot of the members of Congress, um, if they can manage to agree on a DOD funding and just do continuing resolutions for everything else, then they are, to a certain extent, avoiding doing what they need to do, which is making the hard choices that we, that we talked about. But um, I think Jess is right. I think the funding the DOD is low-hanging fruit. It's, it's the easiest thing for them all to agree on. It makes them look good. It you know, pushes off problems to another day. Um, and, and it means that, that the military has at least the budget that it needs to do its things. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. there you are. At what, at what point do you think our military might decide to take matters into their own hands? Um, I <laughs> 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 that was a test that's happened so many times in history where you tick your military off and they decide they want to be the government. Absolutely. And to me, um, again, from the, uh, my ignorant viewpoint is that they're not getting the leadership from the president or Congress they need. This has got to be uh, a real sore point with them. At what point does a commander, a theater commander, say to the president, go away, let me do my job? So, th I mean, th this is a question that we, we talk about in U.S. civil military relations, and, and I think that that phrasing of it is more the one that we tend to focus on when we're looking at U.S. civil military relations. Generally speaking, um, we, we don't spend a lot of time concerned about an outright coup in the United States. Um, if, if anybody reads The Onion, they did a piece a couple years ago about Marty Dempsey talking about how, he, how easy it would be for him to conduct a coup, and in the United States, it's funny, and it's in The Onion, and it's satire because no one is really concerned that this is going to happen. Where we do focus, is on the ways that the military can influence policy short of something like a coup, um, either through their uh, sort of attempts to extract resources in the form of the budget, right, saying um, things like, well, we can't possibly follow the sequestration guidelines because that would just be inadvisable and unsafe and we can't do it, so you have to give us more money, whether it's pushing back on the president's policies either in the form of giving a public interview or um, leaking documents to the press that might uh, let the public know what the internal deliberations were. Those sorts of more nuanced ways of influencing policy are usually what we are more uh, sort of looking for more in the US case. Yeah, um, I, we, we have other examples of that. So most recently we have at least reporting, and you know I, I don't know the truth of this or not, but we have certainly reporting that Secretary Mattis was on the phone with the president and the president was saying we should just bomb a whole bunch of people in Syria and Secretary Mattis sort of nodded and said uh-huh, uh-huh and then hung up the phone and turned to an aide and said we're not doing any of that. Uh, so, you know, we, we definitely, right? <laughs> and this is a particularly interesting case, right? We didn't go into the whole, um, because most of them are not there anymore, um, right. issue of uh, active and retired officers serving in senior administration positions, but this is one where Mattis is really interesting because the way we would think about a, a purely civilian Secretary of Defense doing exactly that, uh, basically ignoring the President's guidance, um, I, I think a lot of people would think about that differently than they think about the someone that the President still called General Mattis doing the same thing. And it all goes back to the slide Lizzie was showing about how the public's confidence in the military is so much higher than their trust in other, in other parts of the government. So I, I think just to, to wrap up, um, you point out the lack of leadership, the lack of trust from the military to the government. I think that's a really significant problem. I think governments, uh, as in that triangle slide, the government has a responsibility to provide leadership. The government has a responsibility to make good policy. 
But as we also said, it's not the military's job to make that judgment. It's the people's job to make that judgment. Um, and so while I'm not an absolutist, I do think that there are exceptions. There are extreme circumstances under which you cannot expect moral agents to go ahead and do what they're being told if it's really, really horrible. But in general, I think uh, we, we would hope that the military's response to poor leadership would be to try to help lead from below, right? And, and I don't mean lead from below by going and doing what they want, but to, to try to help the leadership develop better policy. And I mean, you can only do so much of that. It depends on how much they're willing to absorb in terms of advice. Um, but I, I, I think we're already seeing some of, some of the milder forms of what you're worried about, and, and I, I, that's not surprising. Other questions? <laughs> Doctors, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel Jackson Doe, Marine Corps Senior Class. Uh, the question I had was, you had on the triangulation, public government, and the military. And certainly it can be argued that there is a mutual respect between the civilian, the public side, and the military side because we're a voluntary force and we come from the public. So there's a, there's a level of trust there inherent to that origination of where the military derives from. But I can see there that there's transparency, there's oversight coming from both sides. Mm -hmm. Primarily what you said was the population oversight on the government on the extension of the military and how they use the military through policy. But with the lack of overt transparency coming from the government, I would think that that would be the decrease in trust from the population to the government. Mm -hmm. But what would you forecast as seeing that continual decrease in overt transparency from the government then bleeding over to the trust going to the military directly because of the link from us to the government? I think that's a really good question. Um, I would point out what we've got up here is the ideal, right? So our study is both uh, descriptive in the sense that we want to know what these relationships actually look like, but also normative in that we, we want to think about how they should look. And so this is how they should look. This doesn't necessarily describe how they actually look right now. But to get to your point, um, so if the transparency from the government goes down, will that affect the population's support for and trust in the military? I think that, uh, to, to use the most quintessential academic answer there is, that depends. Um, <laughs> but I think that, um, I think you're kind of seeing why that depends. So my example of General Votel, right? In the United States, we currently have uh, a military that feels quite comfortable talking to the press, which I think in many ways is a good thing, right? But it can have its downsides. But one of the, one of the things that that might do is maintain the trust relationship between the public and the military even while the government's transparency is going down. Because if the public has a direct linked to the military through the press, then you still have that relationship. I think if what you see is both a lowering of government transparency and a government retraction of the military away from the press, for example, like if the government started putting restrictions on that, that might be good in some ways, right? Like, I, I don't think either of us thinks General Votel made a good decision in talking to CNN about that stuff. but it might have the effect that you're worried about that that, that would reduce the sort of um, feeling of mutual understanding, mutual trust between the troops and, and the population. And I think the press plays a really interesting role here that is often neglected. Um, one of the arguments that you'll hear frequently is this idea that sort of military officers have an obligation to go to the public to provide transparency when the government isn't doing it, right? Um, where a number of civ mill scholars would argue that's not their job. Uh, it's not their job to hold the government accountable. It's the public's job to hold the government accountable. The question then, of course, is how does the public do that if they don't know what's going on? Um, and in the, the idealistic answer is that in the US system, the Constitution has enshrined the role of the press as the actor that is supposed to ensure that the public can do that, right? That that's the press's role. Um, now, of course, frequently the press gets their information from leaks inside the government. Um, but we also, back to this trust question, potentially have a significant problem in that respect. If you see the news media is down there, um, that the, the news media is trusted significantly less to act in the public interest than, say, the military, right? And so this, this gets back to the idea of 
trust in these various aspects of our democratic institutions um, potentially being out of whack in ways that create issues for these oversight relationships. And that also, as you might guess, has a partisan dimension to it, right? Um, and that, again, um, there's nothing wrong with having parties. Most, most democratic societies have parties and they serve a really important function. But when you, start, um, when you start getting to the point where parties are so far apart that they cannot talk to each other, that they cannot sort of come to any mutual agreement or common ground, then you start having problems. And so as you see a partisan divide on trust in the military, trust in the news media, you might start having disconnects that, that are really hard to fix. Thank you. Um, I was saw that you had a lot of information about the familiarity gap between the public and the military, and I was wondering if there was anything similar between the military and the government. Ah, well, <laughs> <laughs> there happens to be a book. There, there is a book. Um, we should make we should make a slide with all the books. We should. Um, <laughs> there was um, there was a big study done on this back in the late 1990s. A big survey study done. From, uh, from which we have a fair amount of data. Um, and then there was more recently a follow-up survey done in, I think the survey was done in 2014 and the book was published in 2016, um, edited by Jim Mattis and Corey Shockey, um, called Warriors and Citizens or something like that, yeah. Um, so there is survey data on this. Uh, and it turns out that, so one of the criticisms that you'll frequently hear um, is that, well, Congress uh, doesn't do right by the military in whatever form um, because none of their children have to serve. None of their children have to be in harm's way. It turns out that data-wise, uh, members of the political elite are actually more likely to have a family member who has served, a, a close family member, a direct family member who has served in the military than not. The percentage of veterans in Congress is still significantly higher than the percentage of veterans. Oh, hey, look I at that. I got your back. <laughs> The percentage of veterans in Congress is still significantly higher than the percentage of veterans in the general population. It's disproportionately high. Um, and as you might expect, also one thing that we really haven't talked about is the difference between the officer corps and the enlisted corps, right? Um, officers in this country tend to look an awful lot like the political elite, right? Uh, they tend to, um, well, they all have bachelor's degrees for one thing, so they tend to be uh, among the sort of 33-ish percent of the US population, adult population with a bachelor's degree. Um, they are more likely to be white, they are more likely to be uh, middle class or upper middle class, right? The enlisted ranks uh, tend to be much more diverse, um, both politically and, and uh, socioeconomically and all of that. But in terms of familiarity gap between uh, sort of the military and the political leadership, it's actually smaller than the familiarity gap between the military and the general public. Uh, and just to, to that, there's one more point too um, that I glossed over in talking about the familiarity gap to begin with that's relevant both to the public military gap and a potential military government gap is um, that when we're looking at any of these gaps, there's a tendency to sort of assume that there's a causal relationship there, right? That the gap exists because something about being in the military or familiar with the military makes people different. The alternative, of course, is what we would call a selection argument, which is basically um, the, the idea that these people were already different, which is what led some of them to join the military and others to not join the military. Um, and those would sort of manifest the same in data, right? You would see the same gaps, but would be caused by fundamentally different processes which might make us care about them for very different reasons. Um, and unfortunately, because they look the same in a lot of the data, it's really hard to tell them apart. Um, but we're starting to, to be able to do that, and what we're finding is that on a lot of these dimensions, particularly some of the things we showed around things like um, patriotism and views about the military, uh, the gap seems to be less of a civil military one than it is based on party and a few other demogra demographic um, items that basically uh, Republicans in the military on a number of these issues have the same views as Republicans outside the military. It's just that particularly within the officer corps, the balance has shifted more towards Republicans. So if you survey the officer corps as a whole, 
they look more like Republicans than like Democrats, even though individually it doesn't seem like the military service is what's driving those views. Yeah, just to, to, to add to that a little bit, there is a, there is a good amount of, of evidence at this point that most of what we see manifesting as civil military differences are from selection effects, not socialization effects, right? Not change once you're in the military or change from familiarity with the military. Um, uh, you know, so that, that's actually really important and has important implications for if we're worried about any of these gaps. Um, that implies that what you really need to do is start being way less efficient with your recruiting. You need to start recruiting people who are more expensive and harder to recruit because they're different. Right? If, if you worry about this gap. Now, we haven't necessarily established that any of these gaps are really that big of a deal, um, especially because a lot of them are not, in fact, civil military gaps. As Jess pointed out, a lot of these gaps um, don't come from the fact that, that you know, if, you, if you're in the military, you start to think like this. A lot of these gaps come from um, other issues in society that are just manifesting because certain people are more likely to join the military than others. How do, uh, how do you feel the military offering large benefits like enlistment bonuses and free health care affect the public trust in the military? Ooh, I, I was not expecting that twist at the end of that question. Uh, <laughs> you, you may have stumped our benefits expert momentarily. <laughs> so this is what I study. <laughs> um, I think that I, I, I honestly have never thought about the question of whether the fact that the military gets these benefits affects public trust in the military. I do think that we have a fair amount of that. So I'm going to answer the question I wanted you to ask. <laughs> I, do <think laughs> um, I do think we have a fair amount of evidence, though, that the public is very satisfied with the idea that the military gets these benefits. The public thinks that it's absolutely right and appropriate for the military to get these benefits, um, which is the thing that would matter for trust, right? If the public thought that it would, there are two possibilities, right? Either one, the public didn't know, right? The public thought that you all got exactly the same things they got, and if they found out that you got better stuff, then they'd be really upset. I don't think there's any evidence that that's happening. Um, the other possibility is if they did know and they really resented it, that would decrease public trust, I think, because they would feel like, hey, why are these, why are these people getting all of these things? I don't get any of these things. We don't see any evidence of that. What we do see is a public that thinks that the military ought to get health care. They ought to get retirement, right? They ought to get paid vacation. They ought to get all of these things. Um, because the job that they do is very difficult, very demanding, very risky in some cases, right? Um, so in a roundabout way, I think, um, uh, I think what you see is that the public believes that these are merited uh, benefits and bonuses and, and that and therefore they don't really have a problem and it doesn't affect the way they feel about the military. You can ask that question again. Do you want to ask it again? What? <laughs> the one you didn't want to answer. <laughs> Uh, good evening, uh, Lieutenant Commander Garcia. I'm in uh, the War College here with some of my classmates. Um, my question is, to the extent that we likely agree that the military should be a microcosm of the greater society, um, how, you know, if we can agree to that, um, does that affect trust at all? You showed some good stats up there on the demographics of the trust in the military, but mm -hmm. it didn't, in my mind, necessarily speak to, um, you know, why people, why those individual demographics, whether it be age specifically or any others that you have up there, why the military? Is it because of the job? It's not because we wear some uniform. What What is it that and if there's any research that you've done or anybody else has done, why is it that the military is higher? So are you asking, I'm sorry, are you asking what causes the public's high trust in the military? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
I probably could have done that in way <laughs> fewer words. But. <laughs> but you also threw out like three different interesting questions that I also want answered. So, hey. um, the but the I, what we do. I mean, the, the short answer to that, I think, is we, we wish we knew. Um, and there are, there are a number of people who are working on studies right now to try to, to figure that out. Um, one particular question that has, that's being asked is sort of what is the connection between confidence and perceptions of competence? Um, you, anybody who's in sort of like the management leadership type literature probably knows this idea, right, that if you trust someone, it's usually because you um, believe that they're competent and that they have good intentions, right? So those are kind of the two dimensions that you can look at. So one that we can look at is competence, which brings up sort of a, an interesting question of at a time when most of the conflicts that the military has been involved in have not been ones that are sort of clear, decisive winds of a World War II or even Desert Storm style, right? Um, you could predict that that would decrease confidence because the, the perceived competence is not there, right, to go get the job done. We don't see that happening, right? If you go back to, to this, this ends in 2011, right? But you see um, that it still stays pretty high even once we're um, it's even on an upward trend since right. 2003, which is weird. Um, so there are some people who are looking at that. A again, here the question is, to, uh, do you trust them to act in the public interest, which seems to be getting more of the intent question, right, of, of do you believe that these individuals have kind of the public's best interest at heart? Um, so it, it appears that the public does believe that. We don't really know why, and we particularly don't know why uh, the public believes that of the military compared to a lot of other occupations that effectively serve the public in other ways. Yeah, I would, uh, we, we don't know. Um, we, we have lots of theories. Um, one theory is that the, uh, you know, the, the public narrative about the military um, since Desert Storm, uh, there was a concerted effort to change the narrative away from what it had been post-Vietnam, right? So there was a concerted effort to change that narrative into, regardless of what the government's policy is, we're gonna support the troops. They don't have a choice. They signed up to serve the public and that's what they're doing and they're sacrificing a lot to do that. So this, this narrative of um, sacrifice, of public service, of um, heroics, uh, of, of uh, sort of, nobility, um, I think that that has a lot to do with it, but we don't have evidence that that's what's driving it. Um, and just quickly to the point about representation. Yes. Um, we do, we have a, a million more slides that I could go through that I will not because we don't have time um, about the sort of is the military representative? Um, because one of the other strains of this familiarity gap argument is the idea that since the draft, the military has become less representative of society in terms of what it looks like. And that's just not true. That is completely um, flatly not true. If you compare the all volunteer force to the draft era military, in most respects, it is more representative of society. Um, but th there's an interesting question there, right? That the, the sort of, can we agree that that's what we want? Um, and based on some of the things we've talked about already, you can sort of think of three reasons you could argue that is what we want. One goes back to Lindsay's control argument, right? Which is the idea that if you have a military that looks like the society it represents, it should have the same interests as the society it represents, and therefore you don't have to worry about them going off and trying to do things that you don't want them to do. This is kind of some of the citizen soldier argument, right? That if, if the, the warriors are just like everyone else, then they won't have separate interests of their own. Um, another would be an effectiveness argument, right? Which is the idea that if you are systematically excluding groups of people from the military, you are missing out on talent that exists in those groups, right? That could be a part of the military. Um, and so those are both sort of instrumental arguments, right? Of we want the military to look like society because it helps us achieve these other benefits. There's a third, which is more sort of a um, normative democratic argument, which is that we want the military to look like society because it just should, right? That that's something we value as a democratic society, that we're providing these opportunities to people, that the military looks like society, it just is in itself good. Yeah, and, and the good news is that it does. The all-volunteer force is, is surprisingly representative uh, in all of the ways that you think that it's not, 
right? So uh, one, of the, one of the things that you'll frequently hear is that the South is overrepresented. This is true, but it's only by about 3%, which is not a big deal, and nobody should really care. And it's been that way for a very long time. And it's been that way for a long time. This is the other thing, is that a lot of the things that people argue now, they, they make it sound like this is a new, scary thing, when actually it's just been like that all along, and it's never changed. Another one that people worry about is socioeconomic status. Um, oh, geography, go back, we can do. Yep. Yeah, the map so, one, yep. yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, this is a nice one. So if you think the South is overrepresented, um, it might be because of uh, this type of map. So this is 2002, but it hasn't changed much. That's the thing, this doesn't change over time very much. This is absolute numbers of recruits, right? So if you think, oh, I know the South is represented, every fourth officer I've ever met is from Georgia, right? That's because of this, it's because of absolute numbers. But in terms of proportion of the youth population, in terms of proportionality, it's actually pretty good. In fact, the highest proportions of people are coming from these very rural, uh, sparsely populated Midwestern states in many cases. Um, the, the socioeconomic status one is also really interesting. Do we have that slide? Is that this one? Yes. Um, so this is splitting the population into um, five equal groups, right? So 20% of the population. And you can see the richest quintile is a little bit underrepresented. And this um, is looking at enlisted specifically. This, yeah, the, so this is enlisted because, as we said, the officers are going to be upper middle class. Um, the poorest quintile, so if they were perfectly representative, they'd each be at 20%. Right? And you see that they are not each at 20%, but it's really not that bad. Right? So when we worry about, um, when we worry about some, and, and the one that's most underrepresented, as you can see, is the poorest quintile. And this gets back to one of the things just mentioned, which is obesity and other health issues, but also education issues. But you know, the poorest quintile uh, of, of this country's population has a lot of health issues, and many times they cannot pass the, the test required to get into the military. Next. Yeah, go for it. So when it comes to why the military is trusted more than the government, how much that is because you think that when the military messes up, the government's blamed? And then uh, how much of it all, all can also be because of the fact that if the people can't trust the government, they have to feel like they have to trust something, so they're afraid to not trust anything besides the military. Both good theories, thank you, we'll, uh, we'll use those. <laughs> we'll look into that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, the, the question of who gets blamed is a really interesting one, too, that goes to um, sort of a lot of questions around expertise. Uh, the, the students who have been um, in some of our classes around intelligence, right, are probably familiar with the phrase, um, what, there are only policy successes and intelligence failures. Um, so that's one where we see the opposite dynamic, right? That if something goes wrong, the intelligence gets blamed. If it goes well, then it was a good policy. So it's an interesting question, right, of why in the case of military policy, it often seems to go the other way, right? If it goes well, it's because our great military had a great success, where if it goes poorly, um, for example, Vietnam, then it's because those civilians interfered and ruined things. Right, um, so it's yeah, it's it's a very good theory, and we um, except we that we blamed the civilians in Vietnam, and the military still had a bad reputation. So, it, not 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 quite sure. I like the idea, though. I think we should we should definitely look into this: who gets blamed for what thing? But it goes back to what uh, what Jess was saying about the competence argument. Um, and frankly, we just don't see a lot of evidence that competence, that a belief in competence is why people trust the military. They certainly believe the military is competent, um, but it doesn't seem to have any connection to actual performance. And just re really interestingly, one of the more recent ones of these that came out that I didn't have time to get into a slide um, was looking at competence in, in things and with partisan dimensions. Um, and the, the one that could compete with the military and was particularly uh, trusted among Democrats was Amazon. Um, so yeah, uh, Amazon. Uh, so there, I mean, there are these questions of uh, sort of if if people don't trust the government, who or what do they trust and why? And that's a particularly kind of interesting and weird one because it seems to be one where competence is a big part of it. I can ask them for anything and they'll give it to me right away. 
right? Um, and that people have a lot of interaction with, where sometimes the familiarity gap argument is people trust the military because they don't know anything about it. If they actually knew how the military worked, they wouldn't trust it so much, right? But it's sort of off there on a pedestal, so they trust it. Um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of really interesting dynamics to untangle in uh, sort of buried in some of these graphs about who is trusted by whom and why. So we just want you to worry about it. We don't actually have any answers. So please join me in thanking Drs. Blank, Shane, and Khan. I'd also like to thank Anne from the Fleet and Family Support Center. And as you leave the auditorium this evening, if you'd like to come out this way and grab some of their fantastic materials and say hi to her, that would be great. They're our co-sponsor. Can't do this without them. Thank you, Anne. And thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Safe travels home. <laughs>